Welcome to the No More Meds podcast with Dr. Corinne Weaver. Are you stressed out because you keep getting sick and don't know what steps to take? Are you sick of not getting answers from your doctor and always needing to take drugs? How would your life be different if you were healthy? Be inspired and stay tuned for some practical solutions for healthy living. Hello and welcome to the No More Meds podcast show. I am just so excited today to have Dr. Scorbier with me. And yes, I said doctors. We have two of them, uh, twin brothers. And I just want to share a little bit about them before they get into their story. So Dr. Corbier is a board certified neurologist with special qualifications in child neurology. He treats all adult and pediatric neurology conditions such as special interests in working with autism and related spectrum disorders. You've also spoke at Autism One conference that you can listen to. Dr. Corbier works with pandas and pandas and also presents with conducting research. Right now you're working on some research about speech uh, language delay and neuromodulation. He's dedicated uh, to the study of nutrition and it's an important role with brain related disorders and practices nutritional neurology, which combines neurology with evidence-based nutritional approaches to improve the overall health of his patients. In addition to neurology, Dr. Corbier is a board certified in integrative pediatrics. He's been recognized for both his work within the greater Charlotte community, as well as nationally. He's been awarded the patient choice award, favorite physicians in North Carolina for five consecutive years, the compassionate doctor award for five consecutive years, top 10 doctor state North Carolina and many others. He shared his work on TV, radio, and through various lectures and workshops. And he's authored several books and articles, including topics on autism, nutritional approaches to treatment, as well as his restoration model. Dr. Corbet also has started a nonprofit organization to support research for patients with autism and neurometabolic conditions, as well as speech language delay. This nonprofit organization, Brain Restoration Ministries, also supports financially challenged patients seeking ultimate wellness-based care. He's earned his medical degree in 1995 from the College of Human Medicine at Michigan State University, and he completed electives in neurology at Johns Hopkins, the Mayo Clinic, and the University of Michigan. He completed an internship in pediatric residence in Fleet, Michigan, and went on to finish a one year of adult neurology training at the University of Cincinnati in Ohio, followed by two years of child neurology fellowship training at the Children's Hospital Medical Center of Cincinnati, where he was in charge of the neurology clerkship for medical students. He was born in New York City, And Dr. Correa moved with his family to live in Africa for seven years doing missionary work. He grew up in six different countries and has traveled throughout his life and he speaks multiple languages. His faith and life experiences have played a strong role in his philosophy of life and approach to providing quality neurology healthcare. All right, that's just one of you guys. Now let's talk about your twin brother. And he is also a doctor and he's a physician who has attained his medical degree and training in Michigan. He's a board certified internist in internal medicine and he has various medical appointments in the states of Michigan, Florida, and Alabama. Those include being a hospice medical director, a partner in the multi-specialty medical practice and working in a private practice. He's been active in his community. His medical work in Florida included speaking for smoking cessation programs in Flint, Michigan and giving multiple health awareness seminars in the community. He's spoken about health and wellness on various TV and radio programs. Later in Alabama, he became a co-founder of the Acts of Peace Ministry, which is a religious-based inner city outreach program. After leaving his private practice, Dr. Paul Corbier decided to devote his career to working with prisoners, which he did for 11 years. As the site medical director of a large 
prison system in Alabama who oversaw the provision of comprehensive health care to over 4,000 offenders in that prison system. Following that assignment, he moved to Nashville, Tennessee in 2009 from where he oversaw the medical care of 12 different jails across the states of Georgia, Virginia, and North Carolina. Then he relocated to Kansas where he served as the medical director overseeing the provision of care for all the state prisoners. Dr. Paul's lifelong dream has been to reunite with his twin brother. And in 2018, that dream became a reality. He works as a co-director at the Brain Restoration Clinic in South Carolina and shares the very same core values as his brother. Their unique practice offers a double dose of compassionate and confident care. And I am just so thrilled to have the two of you here on the show today. And just with your knowledge, you could share so much. But what do you feel right now that the people need to hear in 2020 on the No More Meds program? Well, first of all, uh, uh, Dr. Weaver, thank you so much for having us uh, on your show. It's a privilege. I know over the years we've collaborated on, on quite a few patients, especially ones that are complex. And so we, we value that collaboration and that friendship. So thank you. And we're glad we have the opportunity to share our message and, and who we are. We know that a lot of individuals are suffering, maybe medically, maybe neurologically. And now if you add this COVID uh, situation, uh, that adds another layer of complexity of stress. And our whole purpose and outlook is one of hope. We believe that no matter how injured, traumatized, medically fragile someone may be, there's hope, especially if the right approach is used. Uh, we see a lot of complex patients that sometimes they want to give up hope because they've been through a lot or they've seen various providers. And, but we're here to tell everyone that with the right approach, with love, compassion, and a good treatment protocol, improvement can occur even if things look dire. Um, so just wanted to start with that and see if my brother want to, wants to sure. add something. I can't read my brother's mind, but I was hoping that he was going to use the word hope, and he did. So, so that's good. I guess we are close as twins, but, but what a powerful word. So in a time of hopelessness where people feel outright lost, be it economical pressures, be it a sense of helplessness in terms of chronic illnesses, some of which might even be, you know, degenerative, getting worse and feeling lost and sometimes even not knowing where to turn to. We think that there's always hope, always hope. And sometimes it is finding the right uh, providers, the right team approach. We do think that illnesses out there are so complex nowadays that it does require the right team approach but we want you to always have hope to know that you can be supported. Uh, as Dr. Weaver mentioned earlier, you know, she, she used the word faith. So sometimes we have to invoke that, our faith. Uh, we have to have trust and hope, all these qualities, persistence, because you know, these illnesses, it's like going through a journey and that journey could at times be long, but if one is persistent, has the faith, and, and believe that they will get well, then, then you will get well. Were y'all raised in a Christian home or did that come like later in life? Yes, we were, we had the privilege of being raised in a Christian home, uh, really strong, devout uh, Christian parents. And I must say, uh, we owe what we are to them. And I know they would say that they owe their lives to you know, what God and Christ has done for them. And I have to say, we have the most loving parents, mother and father. And, you know, when we were young, we were, I hate to say this, but we were little rascals. We, <laughs> just, you know, we didn't take things too seriously back then, but we had very loving and, and patient parents. And uh, that played a big, big role. And their Christian faith is what led us to do missionary work uh, in Africa, several countries. And I must say, we've learned a whole lot. We've grown quite a bit, were it not for our experience in, in Africa and countries like Rwanda, Burundi, Ivory Coast, and Kenya, we wouldn't have the 
you know, the, the, the experience, the patience, the love, the empathy that, that, we've, that we've grown to have. Uh, you know, Rwanda is a country where there was a genocide uh, in the 90s, and that's the very country we were in, and Burundi. In fact, we were, uh, believe it or not, we were persecuted there for a while, mm. but all of that built character and strength and reliance on God. And uh, yes, we're not scared to share our belief in God, we think that that sustains us in our uh, practice of medicine. I would say that, yes, we grew up in the mission field. This was during our formidable years. What parents afforded us, and they're still alive, thank God, is that sense of stability, you know, the feeling nurtured and love. It made us want to serve mankind uh, that way. So that's really where it started from having feeling safe in, in our environment. And, and we realized that not everyone has had that opportunity of growing in such a safe and wonderful and nurturing uh, and loving environment. But we did. And we're so very thankful for that. So we feel this urge to give back with that sense of compassion and love to, to help mankind. Is that one of the reasons why you became doctors to help others? Yes, that's a great question. Uh, we were, I think, probably after two years of living in Africa, we came back on furlough um, vacation to New York City where we had relatives. Uh, and at that time, we had an aunt, a uh, paternal aunt, who said, who asked us, hey, what do you want to do with your life? What do you want to be later on when you grow up? I think we were 13. And uh, I remember saying, well, I don't know. I have no idea. And so this answer, so what do you think about being a, a doctor, a physician? And my answer was, absolutely not. You know, <laughs> I get text to be a, a doctor. There's nothing further from my mind. And But she was a little, a little tough, domineering. She says, no, I think you could be a doctor. I said, no, I can't. She says, yes, you can. And I said, all right, I'll, I'll give it a try. And I remember going to my brother and saying, hey, brother, do you think you'd like to be a doctor? I've already committed. I said, yes. And I think he said, no way. What did you say? Well, I do know that you, she convinced you before she did me. I was a little more stubborn, but um, I did come around afterwards. We always looked up at, the, at this particular profession as being something of, you know, being noble and, and being able to serve. So we always admired that profession, just didn't see ourselves playing that role. So she did convince us, and we've never looked back or regretted. Uh, yeah. you know. And so this is during the time that we were living in Africa. So when we came back from New York, we looked at life in a completely different when way. From Africa. I'm sorry, when we came back. Well, no, when we came back from New York okay. to go back to Africa to serve. So we, we had a lot of experiences there. So, for example, we, we had the, the opportunity to work with leprosy. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, in the Bible, it talks of leprosy and how lepers were ostracized, stigmatized, but with now the desire to then go into medicine, we start to look at these individuals and think, ah, what can we do? Now, of course, we were very young. We hadn't started our training yet, but we started to think, how could we serve mankind, including those that are suffering, those that are disfigured? So all of these experiences played a big role, and everything we did from that moment on, including while we were in Africa, we did it thinking that, hey, later on, we'll become physicians, doctors, we'll be able to help, perhaps in a deeper way than if we did not have these types of uh, experiences overseas. Yeah, and going overseas, it, there's that sense of risk-taking and going abroad, you know, removing yourself from your comfort zone, just really going all out. So I think those were the very things that really prepared us in many ways mentally, gave us mental fortitude to be able to go into medicine and have an impact. So in our careers, it was geared towards doing as much as we can. And maybe later on, we can talk about that. So it wasn't just going through medical school, but just broadening our horizons, taking risks, learning new things uh, so that we could help uh, those around us, those in need. Yeah. And let me just add that among the many experiences we, we had there is before we went to Africa, we, we didn't care about studying and things like that. But in Rwanda, which is the first African country where we served as missionaries, there was a practice where in the local language, uh, it's called Indoha. The lo local language is called Kinya Rwanda. And there was a practice where students would wake up at about five in the morning, 
to study. Now, we weren't used to that. We were used to sleeping at five, not getting up and study, but that's a type of discipline and things that we learned, you know, kids would get up, study, and so that's something that stuck with us, getting up early to study, and slowly we developed that type of discipline and, and hard work that would serve us well later on. That, that's awesome. Um, I don't even know what question to ask other than, you know, how did you go from going to school and then now you're kind of like more on the outside of the medical system with the integrative thinking. So how did that, how did that switch, sh- you know, that's that shift change, I guess. So going back to my career after graduating uh, from medical school and then my internship in residency, I then started a job in Florida, central Florida, Uh, Lakeland, Florida, to be specific, I was part of a conventional, traditional, allopathic, multi-specialty group practice. And we had all the kinds of specialties you can think of and working together. But it was the very traditional conservative environment. Now, I enjoyed it. We learned a lot. We had colleagues at arm's length. If I ran into trouble with endocrine issues or OBGYN, whatever it may be, even plastic surgery, why I can just talk to a colleague and say, help my patient here. And we could, we're all in the same facility, just a large practice. But then I began to see certain issues and I'm thinking of your book there, Dr. Weaver, in terms of no more meds. One of the things that irked me to be perfectly honest is I would see a lot of uh, an over-reliance on medications and drug reps, some of whom I would, you know, discuss their medications, their brand of medications, but I felt that there was such an emphasis on medications, not to mention that I would see many very sick patients. You see, as an internist, I took care of back then the elderly, the geriatric patients, those with heart disease, you know, congestive heart failure, COPD, just some of these very chronic illnesses and only spent 15, 20 minutes at most, at best, trying to take care of these things and then being interrupted at times by drug reps. I've always showed them courtesy, but after all, I felt there was just too much of that presence there and not enough times with the patients. I thought that's what my calling was for. So I begin one interruption. How many drug reps did you have in your practice? Well, at any given day. Yeah, at any given day, if you can believe that we had, as I counted, about 60 of them. Uh, Whoa! Genesis, you know, talking to. Women. I think I thought you were saying like three or four, <laughs> six, sixty. Looking back at it, I could hardly believe that, uh, but that—that's what it was. So I, I talked to the medical director and said, "Can't, can't we curtail this a little bit? Cut back on that because we actually have work to do." And you know, <laughs> and I, I got a bit of resistance there because he felt that he had an operation to run. And so that was perhaps one of the first things that made me question that system. And to make a very long story short, as I began to try to impress on my patients the importance of nutrition and wellness and a personal accountability and backing away somewhat from the medications, I found that a lot of patients were willing to tackle that journey with me, but they didn't have the support for for, for one thing, the other colleagues and others didn't see it that way. So I had to make the very tough decision to part from that system. It was a very tough decision after having vested all my emotions and work, sweat and blood for five years back then to say, I'm going to break away from that. So in, in my case, that was the first thing. I have plenty more to share, Dr. Weaver, but I'll let my twin brother yeah. there uh, say something. So my path was a little different. Uh, When I got accepted into medical school, I also got accepted into a graduate program. And so it's a dual program, medical and uh, interdisciplinary health and humanities. And I think that was the best thing that I could have done because in the graduate programs, I took courses like medical anthropology, medical sociology, medical geography, and so forth. It was a big project that everyone who joined the program um, had to participate in. And so my project was on a model that I developed uh, that's calculated on the biopsychosocial spiritual model that I would later call the restoration model. And one of the things that I've done uh, as part of my project in writing my paper was to work with various 
non allopathic providers, including chiropractors, naturopaths, and various other groups. And I, I did this alongside my medical school classes, and I was able to compare. On one side, there was heavy emphasis on pharmacology, on another, on the other side, there was, you know, looking at the cause of disease and using a more hands on approach. And I was really able to compare the two. Uh, I worked under a chiropractor who really took the time to show me, you know, looking at disease in a completely different way, looking at, you know, the root cause so that that stuck with me. I, I worked with aromatherapists and many others early on that allowed me to think, you know what, I need to look at things in a more comprehensive manner. Uh, and so then later on, after I continued with medicine, then pediatrics, then neurology, I always had the idea that there's more, we need an integrative, comprehensive approach. Uh, and then as I finished my neurology training and decided that I wanted to work with autism, first I started with pediatric stroke, and then I went to work with autism, I found that the traditional approach simply did not work period, you know, because, you know, if someone was having a behavioral problem, you know, you might put them on a type of behavior medication, but that was not enough or there were side effects. And so then and there, I decided, let's look at nutrition, let's look at other approaches that are important. And so as far as my traditional training, I said, you know what, like the Bible says, let's take what's good and reject what's bad, you know, mm -hmm. let's add other things. And so that's how we've ended up developing an integrative, functional-based type of practice based on that type of experience. Everything that we've gone through, whether it's in Africa, our you know, graduate studies, other things have led to our, the approach that we're using right now. I thought of an experience, if I can share that with yeah, you. Yeah, I would love that. In my career, yeah. So, and this is a very practical experience, but that's what marked me early on. So when I was, in fact, in that same setting that I talked about in Central Florida, still feeling my way as a new attending physician, I had a sick patient uh, come to the clinic. And uh, they were, sick. actually, I take that back. This was when I was a resident I, uh, student. During my residency, I was still in training, uh, as it were. And so this uh, patient in his 60s had everything you could think of. First of all, he had had a heart attack, a major one, then developed what we call flash edema and cardiomyopathy, where the heart, the pumping action was weak, and so the fluid backed up in his lungs, and it's as if he was drowning in his own fluid. But besides that, he had several types of arthritis. He had rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis. Plus, he had the trifecta of diabetes, hypertension, high cholesterol. So you kind of get the picture. Now, if you're that sick for that long and you've had heart surgery, you might as well add depression. Yes, he was depressed too. So why was he coming to us and to me and our team and, and I was under supervision there because I was still in training, is that he was so sick that we saw him every couple, two or three weeks. And yes, he had a long, a plethora of medications just to keep him alive. So we thought, you know, so I would see him every two or three weeks like clockwork. But then after a while, he just didn't come. He didn't show up anymore. And we couldn't really uh, connect with him. He stopped coming. now. Guess what I thought when someone that sick stopped showing up? Well, I He's not here I, with us on <laughs> earth. <laughs> That's yeah. right. He's no longer among the land of the living. That's right. And so what then happened was, well, he sort of, I no longer thought about him as much because we had other sick folks. But every now and then I kept wondering, why? What, I wonder what happened to him. But I, you know, hopes weren't high. I thought he just passed away. After about six or seven months, I saw someone come through our doors in our clinic who reminded me of this individual, except that he looked much younger. You could see the glow, looked happy. And then when I looked at the medical charts, uh, when he came in, this particular individual was on no medication. And so I blurted out, you remind me of someone that I knew once he used to come every two or three weeks. And he smiled a certain way, suggesting that it was he. In fact, it was him. He had lost weight. There was this glow beaming. 
Now, you would think that I'd be happy, but guess what my reaction was that I was upset. Now, why was I so livid? It's because he wasn't on the medications that I thought he should be on. Heart medicine right. and so, forth. so I went to the attending physician and I said, you will not believe this, but guess who resurfaced and who is non-compliant? And we love these terms that yeah, we used to use those terms. Non-compliant, yeah. <laughs> not following our doctor's instructions, you know, this paternalistic type of attitude. And this attending had some wisdom and uh, he was brilliant. He says, you know, we'll nail this uh, patient, just uh, check his blood work. And when, when we could tell him how bad his cholesterol is and his blood sugar, then he'll know that he did the wrong thing, even though he looked good, you know? Yeah. So we ran the blood work and guess what? Everything was in range. Now, why would you take medicines if everything were in range as it was in him? We checked his vital signs, his blood pressure, everything looked good. Now, that's not the end of the story. After all of that, he smiled. I, I had to know, what did you do? He said, well, I followed a different path, an alternative path to, to health and wellness. I wanted to take charge of my own health and well, wellness, my faith. And, and, and he said we were meant to be well, not sick. And so he did all the right things there to get that optimum health that he got. And guess what? He never showed up again. And so my impression was that he only showed up to teach me a lesson or two, but I knew that he was living and doing it well. So that was an early experience that really marked me. That is, that is awesome. And I know, um, you know, you being a pediatric neurologist um, and you're kind of being on the other side of the old, you know, the older geriatric uh, patients. Um, but pediatrics, they, do they tend to not medicate as much? I mean, as you see with younger versus older, I don't know when the transitions kind of happen, but pediatrics, they don't look for medication at the very beginning as you, uh, as a neurologist before you got into the integrative work. Is that correct or no? Well, yes, it, it depends. Uh, there are conditions where, you know, other approaches may be used. However, uh, as a pediatric neurologist, I work with a lot of, say, seizures and epilepsy. And so, um, so we, we've had neonates, for example, that are heavily, heavily medicated because their seizures won't stop. Uh, I remember um, I, I, I did a little training in England at University of London. I was studying, a, doing a course there. And one of the things we studied was the use of medications in ADHD. Uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, uh, including in young kids. And I was surprised because then, back then, this was uh, probably in the 90s, uh, they found that comparing the U.S. and Great Britain, that the U.S. used twice the amount of stimulant medications that, that are used in the uh, U.S. I'm sorry, the U.S. used twice the amount as in Britain. And mm -hmm. but there was no better outcome in the ADHD uh, results, that is, you know, kids fear the same. And that played a, you know, I was very struck by that comparison. Uh, and that led me to think, you know what, there are other modalities that can be used in kids other than medications. Kids, uh, you know, they can react uh, depending on the dose that you use and so forth. And so, so yes, in certain situations, uh, medicines are not the first choice, but depending on what's going on, medications you know, might still be used. Unfortunately, unfortunately, in a lot of neurobehavioral problems, for example, we will see young kids that have been diagnosed with bipolar, juvenile bipolar disorder, or aggression, other types of things where they're placed on a lot of the same meds that adults are placed to. So, so that can create a, a problem. So we, so we chose to use a different path, uh, one where we try to get to the root cause so we don't have to be overly dependent on on medications. We think that there, there's still a role or a place, but there's no doubt um, in this country, unfortunately, medications are way, way overused. Uh, so we try to look at other approaches. And there are terms that we do use. Uh, so when we're in the conventional setting, uh, you know, one term that I found myself using a lot, but including in the prison system, can you imagine a prisoner being on a lot of pills and medications? So we use the term polypharmacy. So it's when an individual is just put on way too many medications, think of the fact that they can interact with each mm -hmm. other. Uh, they all have the potential of having 
lots of side effects, being toxic even. And so even if a medication had to be, were, were needed, does someone really need to be on 10, 15, 20 pills? And it adds up. And so it comes at a cost. So, and then, then I become philosophical about that. Was the body meant to be on all these pills? I can't make that uh, come to that conclusion that we were met or designed to be on so many medications. So we really do have to find alternatives. I'll give an example. If someone has heartburn, you could either say, okay, pop a purple proton pump inhibitor pill for the acid, or is there another way to block the acid and to feel better? If there's another way that is safe, that works with the body, with the organism and gets you better, why not choose that? that other option than just relying on the pill for symptom relief. And I have to say also, and you know, you're asking Dr. Weaver about children, uh, even with serious conditions like epilepsy, it's well known that a lot of anti-seizure drugs, anti-epileptic drugs, even if they control seizures, if the child stays on it long-term, there are, there could be cognitive long-term side effects. And so we worry about that. And again, that's why we're always looking for alternatives, whether it comes, whether we're dealing with epilepsy, neurobehavioral problems, pain, headaches, migraines, we think that there are other alternatives that are safe. Uh, we also do, in our practice, we do what's called pharmacogenetics. So if someone absolutely needs a med, maybe for a temporary period of time, we do genetic testing to see if that's the safest option uh, we, when we do use meds, we use the lowest dose possible. And again, we try to make it as temporary as possible. Is that through, is it Genomine? Is that what you're using? Yeah, that's one that we use, Genomine. There's also Alpha Genomics, GeneSight. And so there are a few different ones. And so we, we use different companies depending on the, the situation. I think that's so important when you're looking at the detox pathways, you know, if they can't detox it, pro you know, properly, then it's obviously not good to put them on that medication. So I think that's amazing that you guys are doing that work. Yeah. And, and we are thankful for knowledge of pharmacology and understanding medications because the sad reality is people are currently on tons of medications. So it does require knowledge about these medications, why they were placed on them. And if a couple of them are to come off gradually, how to wean off. So we find that it's important to have that knowledge base to work with the medications, to let the patient know we, we understand why you're on a particular agent and to let them know that there's a better way to systematically wean them off when you can. Sometimes it's harder to do if they've been on it for a long time but we feel that it is our job, all of ours, to educate the patient about the body, its frame. And as Hippocrates said, let food be your medicine and medicine your food. So there, there's so much that we can do with, with how God created us to support the human frame. I like to how say- much, sorry, no, go, go ahead. Well, I was gonna say, how much nutrition did you actually get in medical school? <laughs> <laughs> education wise <laughs> yeah. so, was was there any was there any nutrition yeah, education no. <laughs> the nutrition the little that I got was really you know my training was hospital based in internal medicine through residency so a lot of hospital work and so I clearly remember that part of the limited nutrition I got was around people being in the ICU, maybe on the ventilator, needing a certain amount of protein or certain things that they had to get, you know, in the, in the gastric feeding and how to balance that out and working with the nutritionist that way if, there's, if they were severely diabetic. So really in the ICU, uh, calculating TPN, total parental nutrition. But what's interesting about that fact, and by the way, that was the only training that I got was, if we start, if we had, if we were only paying attention when patients were that sick and needing to be rehabilitated to get out of the ICU in one piece, why not take it a step prior to that in terms of prevention? Do you see what I mean? So yes, we got exposed to it when they were on their deathbed or nearly dying to support them and to get them out of that uh, intensive care setting uh, but, but I always felt that we needed to have studied a lot more of nutrition to not even get to that point. 
place? I think in medical school, now that I think back, we probably had just a few hours, really. But if you compare that to the training in pharmacology and other disciplines, it was really minuscule. And it's almost like it was an afterthought. You know, let's, let's talk, you know, just briefly about nutrition. Yet, we know that nutrition is key. It's very important. I would say a good part of my early training in, in nutrition was after I was completely done with my training and started working with kids with autism. And I have to give a little shout out to parents because they were the ones that would say, Dr. Corbier, what do you think about a gluten-free, casein-free diet? And back then I would say, gluten, what? Uh, casein, what's that? And I to humbly say, I'll get back with you. Let me research this a little bit. But then as I started to research it, I, I found, wow, there, there's a lot to dietary interventions. And then that led to a lot of further research and conference and, and other courses. And so then, you know, we, I, I started to study the role of nutrition in brain health uh, and, and culminating in, in nutritional neurology. So it's really important, even though we weren't given the training that sh we should have been given, it's, it's really important. Well, and it's important to say that even in some of the, you know, standard journals that uh, physicians look at, even in training the annals of medicine, JAMA, and so forth, if you look carefully, even in those traditional uh, journals and studies and research, there is good evidence that nutrition is very powerful for some of the chronic illnesses that we know, hypertension and so forth, that DASH, uh, diet, et cetera. But it was so buried into the other stuff, hardly spoken of. But if someone looked hard enough, they could find it even in the standard uh, journals. And I think that's right, too, because as I started working with kids on the spectrum, I started to uncover pretty good articles dealing with nutrition, even, you know, in very traditional journals like uh, the Journal of Pediatric Neurology, for example. Uh, I saw one article uh, many years ago that was entitled Vitamins Not Surgery in Dealing with uh, Potential Hemispherectomy Patient. And this was dealing with a very young, actually an infant who was having nonstop focal seizures to the point where they were gonna remove half of the brain. That's called hemispherectomy. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Ben Carson, the HUD secretary, uh, actually uh, I met him when I was in college and he played a role in, in my going into neurology because uh, he did a lot of hemispherectomies, but anyway, this young infant was having nonstop seizures and they were going to send this infant to a tertiary center to remove half of the brain. But as part of the evaluation, they looked at different levels, including vitamins, and found that the child needed an activated form of folic acid, folinic acid, and once instituted, the seizure stopped completely. Uh, wow. They also found that adding some B6, P5P, paradoxal 5-phosphate, helped. So that was in the you know Journal of Pediatric Neurology, Vitamins, Not Surgery. And so the same thing applies for a lot of conditions. Sometimes what seems very hard to treat and refractory and tractable could be because we're not looking in the right places. If we see that there could be a metabolic nutritional factor and we correct that, then patients can get better, even very sick patients. As my brother was talking, it dawned on me the following, you know, for just about all the chronic, what, what I like to call lifestyle diseases, hypertension, diabetes, and so forth, recommendations in the most traditional allopathic sense are given in terms of first starting with nutrition. So, so let's say diabetes, so, uh, low glycemic uh, type of diet, et cetera. And so, and I've talked to endocrinologists and others about that, but what, what occurs, and this is almost comical, is it, they just gloss over that. And there's almost that understanding that patients won't even bother with the nutrition. So then let's take the next step with medication. So all I'm saying is what if there were more emphasis on these first and earlier steps of intervention? But I think in a way one could argue that traditional medicine almost gives up on the patient's will to make these real lifestyle modifications that could be impactful. So they'll say, no, I don't think they'll really change and modify their diet. Therefore, we'll have the insulin uh, ready to be given. And then all the energy is, is given towards medication and so forth. 
So it is part of the algorithm, the part of the process of thinking of first intervening with good nutrition. And if one really paid attention to that, and then we could talk about more, shall we say, more involved things like intermittent fasting and things like that, that really, if done right in the proper nutritional programs, could really, really turn things around. Do you see the shift now with people wanting to make a stand on their health and be um, more reliable, I guess, for their nutrition and diet and feel like they can do something instead of relying on what the doctor says all the time to take this med? Do you see that kind of shift happening in the last few years? We are, but I have to say that it's a lot of times driven by patients themselves because, you know, patients are saying, look, we're, we're tired of not finding the root cause. You know, we've, We've seen, I know Dr. Weaver, the same with you, you see patients that they've been to a lot of providers are not getting to the root cause. And so a lot of times patients and families are driving this. They're saying, no, we want something better. We want, we want real health. We don't want just covering up the symptoms and not getting to the root cause because they're tired, they're sick, they're suffering. So there is a shift, uh, but I think that shift is pushed by parents, you know, and, and patients wanting something something better there's a bigger growing realization that nutrition plays a role that you know that, that there's an alternative way not just big pharma you know and i sorry i have to bring the term big pharma to this discussion. right right i totally understand <laughs> yeah. so bef before we end what would you like to go over i don't know if you have how many pillars five pillars or whatever what the restoration model is um before we close sure so the the restoration model is based on the concept of what I would call a bio, psycho, social, spiritual approach. So where we do everything we can biologically looking at the root cause, but also looking at psychosocial factors, emotional factors, and also not ignoring the spiritual factors. I have to say as a Christian physician, I've seen patients that were so intractable that you know we've done everything we could biologically and sometimes there's a spiritual element too that once we factored that in then the patient got better so the restoration model is one of hope where we do not give up and we believe that total restoration returning to health is possible by following uh, all of the different principles health principles lifestyle but also very holistic comprehensive biopsychosocial spiritual approach and the only thing i'll add to that is Collaboration. We really don't have all the answers. We've seen a lot uh, over the years, but we find that each one has their niche and specialty and to the ability that we can collaborate and find that uh, multi or have that multidisciplinary approach that, that serves the patient as well. Well, I appreciate so much uh, for your time today to speak to the No More Med show. And I believe there's going to be a lot of people that don't want to give up hope just from listening to this today. And thank you guys so much. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of the day. Thanks for listening to the No More Meds podcast. If you enjoyed this podcast, please share your favorite episodes with your family and friends, or at least leave a review on iTunes or Stitcher. The content and opinions expressed are those of the host and presenters. They are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent disease. Product statements have not been evaluated by the FDA.